Thank you, those of you who have stayed to the sweet end, uh, at least of today's discussion. Um, the three presenters are David Cook, who received his PhD from Chicago University, teaches at Rice, uh, has done extensive work not only on historical uh, apocalyptic beliefs in Islam, but contemporary, which makes him a fairly unusual figure. Um, as well as books on jihad and addressing suicide attacks. And um, I think, and as I mentioned in my opening speech, he's the one who in fact introduced me to the topic. Um, J.M. Berger, who's a researcher, analyst, and writer covering extremism, special focus on extremist activities in the US. He's just co-authored a book with Jessica Stern called Americans Who Go to War in the Name of Islam, oh, oh no, ISIS the, state, ISIS, the State of Terror with uh, Jessica Stern, and uh, he's also written Americans Who Go to War in the Name of Islam. And then finally, our last speaker, Michael Pregil, who is not as I corrected my assistant, Katie, when she put this together. He is an interlocutor at Boston University, which means, among other things, that he is the head of a humanities digital project in Islam, but not a formal professor. Are you teaching courses? I will, actually. Let's hope so. Um, What's and up? His research focuses on early Islam and Islamic literature. Uh, as well as the perception and representation of Jews and Christians in Islamic culture. So with no further ado, let's begin with David. Okay, in contradistinction to what's written in the, uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the minutes, uh, I'm actually going to be speaking about Book of Ram, uh, which is my primary interest right now as far as contemporary movements go. And my research is focused upon the question of whether Boko Haram is an apocalyptic movement. Now, obviously presenting here, um, <laughs> I won't deny that I'm going to trend towards, uh, towards stating that it is, but I am also very much aware of the problems with classifying Boko Haram and uh, the issues. And so I, I view this as a, as a work in progress, something that uh, will probably be needing to, uh, to be updated. Um, before I start off, I'd like to pay tribute to Richard since it's been uh, now 20 years since uh, he and I met at the uh, library, the, the, uh, uh, the National Library in Jerusalem, and he introduced me to apocalyptic. I'd like to correct that statement. I had already read some material in the, uh, in the classical Muslim sources, but it wasn't until I fell under his spell that I started to see the widespread affinities of this uh, trend. And so I'd like to thank Richard for all of the effort that he has put into the Millennial Conferences and getting us all together one last time. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Since its violent inception in 2009, the group known as Boko Haram, originating in northeastern Nigeria, Borno, Yobe, and Adamawa states, has changed from using low-level guerrilla tactics to outright warfare. It is no longer correct to speak of the Boko Haram violence as being merely an insurgency, as one can find in the Nigerian uh, newspapers. Since the beginning of 2004, 14, it has uh, become essentially Nigeria's second civil war. Although outside observers have started to take Boko Haram seriously, unfortunately it is clear that the Nigerian government and military only started to do so during the period following February 1st, 2015. Boko Haram's origins are in a quietist Salafi movement led by the charismatic Muhammad Yusuf, who was murdered in 2009. The group took its name, or was accorded it, as a result of the strong opposition to any forms of secular education, and throughout the early 2000s was characterized uh, by withdrawal from, soci as from society. In spite of a brief flare-up of violence in 2004, until the Nigerian police attacked uh, Boko Haram on July 26, uh, 2009, the worst that one can say 
that it was one of dozens of Salafi and other radical Muslim groups in northern Nigeria. Here I'd just like to intersperse with my own personal recollection since I traveled Nigeria in 2005. Um, I actually had an opportunity to interview Olama uh, about it prior to its becoming quite prominent. And many of them were very familiar with the teachings of, of Muhammad Yusuf. None of them believed that it was likely that the group would go anywhere. At that particular time, it was known as the Nigerian Taliban. Uh, and my analysis of that initial flare-up of violence in 2004 is that uh, it, was a, it was a progenitor of what was later to happen in 2009, uh, the culmination of Muhammad Yusuf's apocalyptic teachings, which I'm going to talk about in just a sec. With the well-publicized murder of Yusuf at the hands of the police, Boko Haram went underground, sur resurfacing about a year later under the leadership of Abu Bakr Shakao, together with the help of Manman Nur and Khaled El Barnawi. It's important to notice that this is a leadership that's primarily derived from the northeastern section of Nigeria, which is characterized by also a lengthy history of jihad, uh, especially going back into the 1500s, uh, which we'll allude to in just a sec. Throughout the 2010-2011, its activities were consistently violent, characterized by targeted assassinations of prominent politicians and clerics who opposed it, attacks on educational and medical institutions, and confrontations with the police. Starting in late 2010, Boko Haram began a grander scale of activity focusing upon the Christian minority of northern Nigeria, often ethnic, uh, ethnically Igbos from southeastern Nigeria, with numerous attacks upon churches and religious figures, having the stated goal of driving Christians out of the north entirely. The attacks of 2010 through 2012 used some suicide attacks for a total of 11 operations at that time. Since then, uh, Boko Haram has carried out an approximately 65 uh, suicide attacks. Boko Haram, like other successful Salafi jihadi groups, has demonstrated the ability to master a wide range of tactics. Essentially, the group has two basic tactical methods which are uh, one of which is uh, the individual small group and focuses upon individualized terror, assassinations, drive-by shootings, local terror, and suicide attacks. And two, which is massive and concerted attacks, usually highly mobile, uh, mobile use, utilizing motorcycles or trucks to attack a, a given smaller or comparatively less defended target than massacring the target population, or in some cases, recently taking them captive. Initially during the period 2010-2011, Boko Haram favored the first tactical method and even today still utilizes it. But especially since the beginning of 2014, Boko Haram has favored the massive attack method. In 2011, Boko Haram began using suicide attacks, especially against targets that were not located in its home established territory, the northeastern states of Borno, Yobe, and Adamawa. It's clear in retrospect that this development, which was accompanied by the appearance of a suicide attacker video in September 2011, that's the only video that they have actually put out that um, where there's an identifiable figure. Um, so it kind of stands out in the repertoire. It was one that paralleled the trajectory of the Islamic State in Iraq, uh, in other words, the precursor of ISIS. It would be useful to understand that there appears to be a lag time between when ISIS introduces a tactic or concept and the period when Boko Haram picks it up. This is apparent with regard to the establishment of the Caliphate by ISIS and the concurrent uh, establishment of the Caliphate by Boko Haram on August 24, 2014. Other parallel developments will be noted below. Although the targets focused upon by Boko Haram have shifted considerably during five years, it is still possible to make some generalizations. During the first two years, Boko Haram favored local targets that were closely associ associated with its doctrinal positions. These included attacks on educational and med medical facilities, attacks on public order offenses, and this is from a Muslim point of view, which included bars, gambling establishments, marketplaces where the selling of non-halal meat took place, and above all, the targeted assassination of Muslim religious figures who had opposed the group. And here I'd like to just make a, 
a statement about that because there's uh, there's 11 target assassinations that are associated with Boko Haram, um, and it's rather significant to notice that uh, unlike other different Salafi jihadi groups, the groups uh, the targets that it chose were usually actually Salafis or Wahhabis that were fairly closely doctrinally associated with the group. And so my interpretation of that is, is that this, uh, this is a group that definitely wanted to eliminate close distraction from the opposition. It did not, for example, go after what we would call like obvious targets among Sufis. Uh, it would attack Sufis, definitely, but its targeted assassinations were almost always directed against clerics that were, uh, that were doctrinally very similar to the, to the group itself and generally posing a quietist Salafi ideology or a quietist Wahhabi ideology. <clears throat> the second broad category of targets could be characterized as vengeance for Muhammad Yusuf targets. It included security forces or military targets. During this period, Boko Haram usually emphasized that it demanded justice, justice for the murder of Yusuf, among other demands. During the period 2011 to 13, Boko Haram shifted its targets considerably. While local terrorism of the type described above continued, the group projected its power into two areas. The Fulani Hausa heartland around Kano and Zaria, which is north central Nigeria, and the Middle Belt, most especially the flashpoint city of Jos, where there are frequent clashes between Christians and Muslims. And Kaduna, the capital of major, a major middle belt state, and most especially the federal capital of Abuja. These attacks were mostly spectacular in nature, and many of them were suicide attacks on a very distinctive locations, churches, government buildings, army bases, obviously chosen for their symbolic value. Churches in Christian locations were often attacked on Sundays or at other key Christian holidays, such as Christmas and Easter, again, in order to maximize the casualties and symbolism. According to Jacob Zinn's analysis, these attacks were directed by Man Man Nur and Khaled al Barnawi. Now, these two figures uh, today don't figure much in the news, but uh, especially Man Man Nur is uh, actually Cameroonian and represents what we can call kind of the international side of Boko Haram. And uh, I strongly suspect that we'll be hearing more from him uh, in the future. <clears throat> who also origi were originally Muhammad Yusuf's uh, disciples and who both resented the Kanuri particularism of Shikau. Chicago, uh, during the five years uh, following the reestablishment of Boko Haram, emphasized very strongly the Kanuri identity of Boko Haram. It no longer was an international sort of thing. It, uh, linguistically, it focused oftentimes on, the, on Kanuri demands and uh, more than occasionally harked back to the period of Kanuri greatness, uh, which was in the 1500s uh, with the great jihad of Ma Idris uh, that uh, there's a, an Arabic text that describes that. Um, it is quite remarkable that such high-profile attacks did not generate a civil war at that time. Throughout 2011-2012, a number of Boko Haram bomb factories were found or blew up, and it's striking how apparently these discoveries contributed to the temporary disappearance of suicide attacks from the group's repertoire. With the exception of the Maiduguri bomb factory that blew up, all of the bomb factories were located outside of the core areas of northeastern Nigeria, indicating that Boko Haram sought to construct bombs as close as possible to its targets. For whatever reason, the Nigerian military enjoyed a period of some success against Boko Haram during the later part of 2012 until summer of 2013. Boko Haram continued to carry out operations in northern, northeastern Nigeria, but was unable or unwilling to carry out operations elsewhere in Nigeria. This period of comparative containment ended on May 14, 2013, when President Goodluck Jonathan declared a state of emergency in the three northeastern states dominated by Boko Haram. Operations conducted by Boko Haram during this period of 2012-2013 
had tended to revert back to low technological means. There were a number of mass attacks that would become so characteristic of the group in 2014, but during this period, they tended to be carried out by small weapons, knives, machetes, and small guns rather than the automatic weaponry uh, currently favored. It's clear once again that the change occurred with, with the glut of weaponry that flooded West Africa in the wake of the fall of Muammar Gaddafi <clears throat> and the appearance of large numbers of dislocated fi fighters in the region. At first, these fighters and their weapons tended to, ra to aid the rise of Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and the number of different other groups that took over in the area of Timbuktu uh, during 2012 and uh, up to 2013. But with its defeat at the hands of the French in January 2013, apparently a large number of fighters and weapons became available in both Nigeria, to Boko Haram, and in the CAR, and aided in the rise of Seleka in March of 2013. By the end of 2013, we could begin to see a new phase in Boko Haram's tactics. The first manifestation of this change is the rise in large-scale massive attacks, usually on villages with heavy loss of life. At least 2,053 people were killed, for example, during the first half of 2014 by these mass attacks. Starting in spring 2014, Boko Haram began a campaign of kidnappings, most famously the some 219 to 276 schoolgirls uh, kidnapped on the night of April 14th to 15th, 2014, from a boarding school at Chibok. Although some of the girls managed to escape, it's clear from the video taken of them on May 12th, uh, 2014, and from the statements of Chicago, that the vast majority of them are still under the control of Boko Haram, and most probably, as he stated, have either been married to the fighters or sold into slavery. Um, this is the first moment where we start to see the trend of, uh, that's exemplified with ISIS is the revival of slavery. Um, and my interpretation of that is, is that this is well before the declaration of the caliphate on the part of Boko Haram, but already Boko Haram is starting to think about itself in terms of territoriality, as opposed to uh, its previous hit and run uh, sort of methodology, and that uh, the beginnings of kidnap mass kidnappings, which now have been more revealed by the release of uh, almost a, a thousand women during the last couple of weeks, uh, we begin to get a sense of how many women were actually kidnapped by Boko Haram uh, during this process. Nor is that the only kidnapping of women and girls carried out by Boko Haram. The number of other raids have focused upon this end through the summer of 2014. By the end of 2014, Boko Haram probably had around 10 to 15,000 soldiers. And I recognize that that estimate is considerably in advance of what you'd find on, uh, associated with uh, intelligence operations, but that's my own uh, assessment right there based upon their operations, their number of losses, and their ability to project power in various different areas. Another concurrent manifestation of the caliphate phase of Boko Haram has been the reintroduction of suicide attacks, which are reflected in the most recent mass casualty attacks. One such paradigmatic uh, mass casualty attack was on November 10th, 2014, when a suicide attacker disguised as a student exploded himself among the students at a male boarding school in Patiskum, a major city in Yobe State, killing some 50 students. Again, one can see that focus upon education as uh, being a major uh, target for Boko Haram. Obviously, uh, with regard to the Chibok girls, that's also uh, a characteristic as well. This attack was followed in the wake of another major suicide attack at a school nearby, killing some 42 students on July 6, 2014. From these attacks and some tw uh, 10 to 12 others uh, since the beginning of 2014, it's clear that Boko Haram continues to view secular education and its institutions as a primary target. What is most interesting for outside observers is there do not seem to have been any serious security measures in place uh, in, in any of these locations. For Boko Haram's attacks to be defeated, there needs to be a, a system of guarding and alarm for isolated schools. It's unclear when Boko Haram has set uh, educational facilities as a target why the Nigerian government and military have not responded with setting up appropriate security measures. 
Female suicide uh, attackers have become more common since uh, June 2014, with a string of at least six between June and July of that year, a year ago, and a further dozen during the period June 14, uh, I'm sorry, December uh, 2014 and February 2015. While suicide attacks for, by Boko Haram have gone through a hiatus uh, starting at the end of 2012, one of the defining characteristics of the recent attacks has been the recent, uh, their reappearance. Although there's little, little information, it seems clear that Boko Haram has a women's wing, which is headed by one Hafsat Bako, who was arrested in July 2014. Female suicide attackers have the advantage inside uh, Nigeria's conservative Muslim environment of being able to conceal explosives under their garments without attracting undue attention. So the fact is, is that there's been some 25 female-led uh, suicide attacks uh, since June uh, 2014 demonstrates that this uh, strategy is effective to some degree. Their tactics demonstrate some lessons learned from Iraq, as it is evident from the attack of November 25, 2014 in the Maiduguri marketplace, where some 30 people were killed in a double suicide attack. One girl exploded herself in the midst of the shoppers, while onlookers rushed to help those uh, injured, another exploded herself. This type of tactic, playing on the basic instincts of people to help those in need, is one that derives uh, from Iraq. It's clear from the accounts and bewilderment of the Nigerian military that no effective means by which to counter the uh, threat of female suicide attackers uh, is yet in place. But the most deadly attack during the recent past uh, was the suicide bombing of the Great Mosque of Kano in November 29, 2014. The backdrop for this attack appears to have been the activist attitude of the new Emir of Kano, Lamido Sanusi, who has publicly called for Nigerians to fight back against Boko Haram. Although he was outside of Nigeria when the attack happened, it appears to have been Boko Haram's answer to his call. The methodology of the attack again demonstrates an ISIS-like uh, sophistication. While an initial suicide bomber drove a car right into the mosque in the midst of uh, Friday prayers, this was followed by gunmen outside attacking the worshipers uh, in the mosque with arms, again exploiting the panic created by the initial bombing. These gunmen were all beaten to death by the, by the crowds. What was little noticed was the fact that there were actually a series of follow-up attacks that were foiled. They included an audacious female suicide attacker's attempt to explode herself inside the Mursala Muhammad Hospital among the victims of the initial attack. So it wasn't just a, a double attack, it was actually a triple attack, although the final element of it uh, was foiled. So the track record of the Nigerian military encountering Boko Haram has been a miserable one. Remarkably, the state of emergency proclamation of May 2013 coincided with a series of defeats for the Nigerian military and its inability to take proactive measures against Boko Haram. Um, I'd just like to comment here, because last summer I was doing a trip through Africa, and as I was passing through Zambia, uh, in the capital of Lusaka, happened to get a newspaper there, and lo and behold, on one of the pages, there was a great big advertisement that was taken out by the Nigerian embassy saying, Boko Haram is being defeated. <laughs> and <laughs> inside this, uh, I, I, of course, this is extremely important to have this advertised to the people of Zambia, um, and, but all you had to do is just turn the page, and the very next page you got uh, a news item that said that listed off a number of different cities that had actually fallen to Boko Haram. <laughs> and so you, you, you were amazed at the, I, I don't know quite, I, I, other to use uh, Richard's term of uh, cognitive dissonance <laughs> that you got between the, what are the proclamations of the Nigerian embassy in Lusaka to what was happening in, um, uh, in Nigeria. So it's clear that the elements of the military suffer from a siege mentality and are unwilling to carry out the type of anti-guerrilla warfare measures perfected uh, by a number of militaries during the 1960s and 70s. These include proactively seeking out guerrilla bases, usually on foot, 
at developing local intelligence sources, making certain that the villagers whose lives are, are threatened and destabilized by Boko Haram see the military as an ally rather than an enemy, and above all, denying the guerrillas the mobility that they need to survive. Okay, let's go to the apocalyptic question here. Studying the ideology of Boko Haram is far more difficult than studying that of ISIS or other Arabic or Urdu language-based uh, Salafi jihadi groups. The group uh, regularly issues videos, uh, but these are recorded in a number of different languages, usually Hausa, but occasionally in Kanuri or Arabic, and sometimes even in English. Uh, Shakao's English is broken at best, but he oftentimes intersperses his, uh, his text with comments or in English or uses some English words for certain matters. His videos since the beginning of 2014 have mostly been translated into English, but the pre precise Islamic affinities of his language and citations you are usually the first thing that is lost in translation. However, there are several points that one can say absolutely. First, uh, that uh, Muhammad Yusuf preached an apocalyptic redemption that serves as the basis for the pre-2009 Boko Haram. Now, that's on the basis of his surviving videos and lectures, uh, some of which are being translated by uh, one of my doctoral students. And so we have a number of uh, apocalyptic uh, affinities right there um, that can be documented. The essence of his teaching was withdrawal prior to the end of the world and a full elimination of any association with Western or more particularly any non-Muslim uh, culture and customs. He is best understood within the lineage of the West African reformer, the Mujaddid, or renewer, rather than an, as an actual Mahdi figure. There's no real evidence I can find that he actually proclaimed himself uh, to be a Mahdi. To that end, Shikao and his followers usually cite the reforming work of Sheikh Osman Danfodio, who died in 1817, and who is considered to be normative and authoritative uh, throughout uh, Muslim West Africa, most especially in uh, northern Nigeria. It's very open question how much of this apocalyptic ideology Shikao took with him after Yusuf's death. And here I'd like to just state, this is uh, the methodological basis of my research is that, uh, is that the, the 2009 operation really does represent a decisive break in Boko Haram. And we cannot look at uh, previous incarnations of Boko Haram and assume that the material, for example, from pre-2009 or even that material pre-2013 actually has relevance for today. Um, and so I'm primarily going to work uh, in my assessment here on the material that's coming from the videos from 2013, 2014, and obviously then the two videos that have appeared this year. So when looking at the operations of Boko Haram, there's definitely a focus upon syncretistic Muslim customs, such as attacks on bushmeat sellers, gamblers, and other social issues. Chicago's ideology, as respect, uh, ex expressed in his many videos, is the major source by which we can test the affinities of the group. Without a doubt, Boko Haram is Tukfiri. We can start with that, absolutely. As Shikawa is on record saying that he would kill his own father if the latter strayed from Islam in the slightest. And he uses the hadith of uh, sharpening your knife uh, to kill your, uh, your sacrifice, which is exactly the self-same hadith uh, that was cited uh, in the last night by the, um, by the September 11th attackers. So his rejection of state names, especially that of Nigeria and religious nationalist Salafi movements like Yanazawa, is quite clear in his video texts. And it's uh, to that that I attribute his assassination of various different Wahhabi and other figures, is that he viewed them not only just being as ideological competitors, but also purveyors of what we can call like uh, religious nationalism, where uh, Chicago really views himself as being uh, transnational uh, in, his, uh, in his global jihadism. So, uh, for example, in May 1st, uh, 2014, he says, if you say, I pledge to Nigeria, my country, it is wrong in an act of paganism. And in a lot of his different videos, what he'll do at that particular point is he'll take a flag of Nigeria and light it up. 
uh, or occasionally, he, uh, more demonstratively, he'll take an AK and actually fire at the flag. Um, so these are, uh, I think, uh, bridge burning uh, moments, very strikingly similar to the sort of things that we can find about foreign fighters joining ISIS, uh, burning their passports and so forth, uh, demonstrating that they can't go back. Uh, so I, I interpret it within those uh, contexts. There's equally no doubt the Shakal loathes Muslim clerics. Okay, now here definitely we also have a trope coming out of the classical uh, apocalyptic heritage. So one of the first things that the Mahdi is oftentimes said to do is to kill off the Muslim religious elite, the ulama. Um, and that might be kind of shocking to some people who don't, don't read this material, but Definitely within Muslim apocalypticism, going all the way back into the 8th century, there's a strong feeling consistently demonstrated uh, that one can find historically and up to the present time that the ulama are basically the problem. And that any form of what we can call state-sponsored Islam is fundamentally compromised and cannot be salvaged. So we definitely find that with regard to Chicago. So from his March 24th, uh, 2014 video, he states, I promise that we will kill all of your Muslim clerics. I will spare none but those who follow Allah and the Prophet Muhammad. Whoever follows the Jews and the West is my enemy. So nothing more explicit there comes uh, with regard to his, uh, his feelings. This hatred of the ulama is very characteristic of certain strands of Salafi jihadis and has its roots in apocalyptic beliefs about the corruption of the religious leadership of Islam before the end of the world. <clears throat> Schools and, demo and democracy are the principal manifestations, according to Boko Haram, of non-Islam. Quote, we are find, uh, fighting Christians wherever we meet them, and those who believe in democracy, and those who pursue Western education. That's from his uh, February 24th, uh, 2014 video. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that Boko Haram has indulged repeatedly in attacking schools and kidnapping schoolgirls, just like ISIS in its Revival of Slavery article from October 2014. Chicago clearly sees slavery as being part and parcel of the jihadi purification of society. From his May 1st, 2014 video, Chicago states, quote, what, uh, what I will want uh, you to know is that there is slavery in Islam. How can you say that there are no slaves? It is in the Quran that said so, end quote. It is clear from reading his statements that Chicago believes that the institution of slavery is one that is designed to benefit the saved sect, al firqa al-Najia, uh, or a taif al-Mansura, depending on which uh, text you use, at the end of the world. Now, here I have to do a little bit of a digression about what there isn't. Um, and what, what we don't have is any view of how Chicago views the future society. And we have very few citations, and again, this may be a function of the, tr uh, the translations, but we have very few citations of actual portents of the hour. Now, I, I think that the general uh, flow of, uh, of Chicago's statements is very definitely apocalyptic in its nature, but um, but we do lack certain elements that I could say would lead us to the same sort of apocalypticism that we can see in ISIS. Now that could have several different uh, interpretations. One has to do with the bad translations. Two, uh, it could uh, also have to do with the personal ignorance of Chicago. Um, we cannot say that this is a man who makes any pretense to being an intellectual. Um, and uh, definitely, he harks back to Muhammad Yusuf on a regular basis as if to justify any particular things that he says. Well, Muhammad Yusuf said this, and so uh, he views that as kind of being a, a, a final proof uh, for the matter. So there's different interpretations. I obviously tend to, to see Boko Haram as an apocalyptic movement, um, but there are also problems in you know, what we can say clinching it. It's not clear how Boko Haram will justify its most recent reverses. Most likely they will be placed within the rubric of apocalyptic temporary defeats designed to, to test the believer. 
As one can say, these reverses have had the effect of binding Boko Haram ever closer to the mainstream of Salafi jihadism, both in Africa and the Middle East. So, in conclusion, Boko Haram's capacities have been diminished significantly during the past three months of operations by the armies of Chad, Niger, Nigeria, and Cameroon. I deliberately gave them in that order because I do not think that this victory was attributable to the military of Nigeria. It is significant, however, that Nigeria did not really win this war and has the capacity to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. It is even more significant that Boko Haram, in spite of its territorial losses, still has not fallen apart, nor has it lost the ability to carry out effective operations. Its most likely course of action will be to wait out the attacks on its bases in, in the Sambisa forest and along the Cameroonian border, especially given the fact that Cameroon is clearly the weakest link in the joint task force against uh, Boko Haram and to reconstitute itself when this coalition falls apart. The other thing that I'd like to point out is uh, that none of the Nigerian army operations have actually been directed towards that wing of Boko Haram that must exist in the area of Kano that's carried out a number of different suicide operations right there. So that area has yet to be suppressed and could actually serve as a renewal of Boko Haram as an urban guerrilla group, possibly. The current alliance between ISIS and Boko Haram, renaming itself the province of West Africa uh, during the very recent past, bespeaks a willingness to, uh, to fight for the long haul. I'd be very surprised if Boko Haram is actually crushed in the near future and believe that the group has demonstrated a surprising level of ingenuity and perseverance. Having said that, it's possible that Boko Haram has gone as far as it can under the leadership of Chicago, who does tend to focus on the Kanuri northeast of Nigeria rather than the House of Fulani heartland of Central and West North Nigeria. Thank you.